Thank you. 
morning one and all i dr hemant mahalle principal of sri vichurpini mahavidyalaya sona welcome all of you on second day of this international conference in today's first session we have an eminent personality as our plenary speaker dr in Ichiro Ozawa from Okayama University. Yes, all researchers, faculty members, and students. to take the advantage of this lecture which will be very much useful for their future i hand over this mic to professor dr swati tathod the convener of this international conference to conduct the session i request all the students to please mute their mic for the session thank you thank you very much good morning good afternoon and good evening to one and all from different time zones of the globe myself dr swati tathod assistant professor and head department of botany and convener of the icma 2021 it gives me welcome all distinguished faculties of different universities eminent scholars of renowned institutes students and esteem audience join here for this conference from different corners of the globe i most warmly welcome honorable president of this session dr satish n malade associate professor and head department of botany government institute of science and humanities amravati now i respectfully welcome today's speaker of the session dr shi ichiro ozawa scientist institute of plant science and resources okayama university japan i ban guru now today's our speaker dr satish n malade sir assistant professor associate professor and head department of botany government institute of science and humanities amravati he is going to chair the today's session i request sir to occupy the respected place please sir yes. sir published total 65 research papers in reputed journals he is recognized guide of amravati university amravati under his able guidance ninety to nine students have completed their phd and five students are in progress he also guided 12 students for mphil project sir completed key research project which are financially supported by dae brns and dndb his area of research is molecular biology and biotechnology sir has total 28 years of the teaching experiment experience for pg department of botany of government vidarbha institute of science and humanities amravati now 
May I request respected Dr. Satish Malode sir to chair the session. Sir, over to you, sir. Please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sati, for the nice introduction. Very good morning to one and all. Firstly, I congratulate Sri Vital Rukmini Arts, Commerce and Science College, Sauna, for organizing international e-conference, A New Horizon in Multidisciplinary Applications in Science and Technology. In this today's first session, we have with us uh, for the plenary talk, Dr. Shin Ishiro Ozawa, the assistant professor, the Ohikama University, Japan. Uh, young researchers in the field of the plant science. As a president of this session, I introduce uh, briefly the Dr. Shin Ishiro Ozawa. Um, he is uh, presently working as an assistant prof professor in the Institute of Plant Science Resources, Okayama University, Japan. As far as uh, <laughs> <his> educational. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kindly mute the mic. As far as uh, his educational qualification is going to be concerned, he started uh, his particular undergraduate studies in the field of biology in the Oikama University from 1990 to 2003. After the bachelor degree, he uh, pursued his particular doctoral uh, studies from 2003 to, two, uh, 2003 to 2009 under the professor uh, Tanasaki uh, professor. Now, uh, after that, he worked as a research associate uh, in the same laboratory under the professor of the uh, Wolman, the Paris in the France, uh, for the period of the three years. After that, uh, he worked as a postdoctoral research uh, in the laboratory of the, again, uh, the pro professor Takasaki in the University of the Japan from the 2013 to 2016. After that, uh, he uh, since uh, 2019, he served as assistant professor, the specially appointed uh, in the issue of the plant science um, resources. As uh, he's a very young uh, dynamic uh, researcher in the field of the plant science, he, re he received uh, different honors and the honors. He received uh, uh, award of the faculty of the science uh, as a dean um, in the Okayama University in 2005. After that, uh, in 2006, uh, he's uh, one part of the poster recognition in the international conference in the Klamada Unas meeting. As uh, you all uh, you know that this Klamada Unas, um, the algae, uh, in that uh, particular, he's part of the recognitions in the field of the photosynthesis. And after that, in 2005 to 2007, he worked as a research fellowship for the young scientist from the JSPS. Uh, and his uh, area of the research is going to be concerned, that is a plant biochemistry, molecular biology, biogenesis, structure, function of the photosynthetic membrane, the protein complexes, the methods uh, in the molecular biology, genetics, biochemistry, biophysics, protein mass spectroscopy, model system, the chlamydomonas, uh, the species. As far as his, uh, but the research is going to be concerned, uh, as uh, I go through the, the biodata, that is uh, the 10 uh, selected uh, publications, they are um, internationally recognized uh, specializations like the, in the journal of the plant cell physiology, like the journal of the plant biological chemistry. All these particular papers um, use the recognition to his particular credits of the research. As uh, he worked on the certain uh, particular mutants in the green alga in the climate uh, as uh, uh, this particular paper is also going to be published um, in the year 2014. That is a plant physiology, a very reputed journal. That uh, this particular photosystem apparatus and the the photosystem being um, structure one is the most important topic uh, for the young researchers. Uh, as uh, with this particular brief introduction, just uh, if you're going to be see that uh, more more uh, challenges in the physiology, after, if you're going to be see that life uh, on the 
earth uh, this depends upon the process of the oxygenetic photosynthesis using the light energy from the sunlight to convert the co2 into the carbohydrates in the plant as well as in the cyanobacteria this uh, particular the producing about the 30% of the total oxygen in the atmosphere like in the algae is going to be conserved and this particular step of the conversion of the light transformation charges uh, into the separation both photosystems energy photons from the sunlight is used in the translocate the electrons uh, across the thylakoid's membranes by the ets systems the carriers like the water is going to be oxidized the o2 and the 4h and by the uh, photosystem 2 that uh, acts as a electron donor for the whole process how this particular process uh, is going to be a challenge or uh, how there are the certain things are going to be uh, tackled in this particular clamada bonas as uh, this particular plenary talk uh, he uh, professor shin oshio was on he selected his particular talk on the structure and function of the photosystem one and uh, more more uh, particular uh, we can going to be see from uh, this uh, plenary talk now with this brief introduction i hand over uh, this particular the mic to the dr shin oshio ishro uh, osawa uh, for his uh, particular plenary talk thank you now over thank to you. dr shin okay thank you very much a nice introduction and a very detailed uh, introduction <laughs> about the photosynthesis thank you very much <laughs> today i will uh, start now i uh, share okay yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So today, I will uh, give you a topic about uh, my uh, previous works. Actually, it's not the present works, not preliminary works. It's what they are already published before. So first of all, I would thank for the uh, for the acknowledgement for the previous and the present bosses, but Yuichiro Takahashi. Uh, he's my uh, teacher, actually. <laughs> So I, I got a PhD supervised his, uh, yeah, his education. And also Francis Sander Wormann is very nice uh, to train my uh, molecular biology or some other genetics in France. And uh, Michel Hippra, he's been uh, very long working with him for more than 20 years, <laughs> more, not around 20 years working. And uh, also this is very important uh, uh, funding source in Japan, Japan Society for the Promotion Science. So I acknowledge all of these people and also that the all people participate in this laboratory. Thank you. And uh, also the, I'm very happy and very, I'm very brief, I'm very thank you for the organizers to give me a very nice opportunity to talk. Thank you. And uh, today is, I want to uh, give you a talk but very briefly, and uh, also I will mention uh, some topics. So uh, I, I didn't know the, the chairs will be <laughs> give some self introduction. So I, I made some slides to, to make some self introduction. But I, so uh, this is a photograph what I'm using the Pyramidomonas. This is a, the model organism. So, <clears throat> so uh, as he, uh, as the presented, I, I had a training on a PhD course in the Okayama University, supervised the Uchiro Takashi. And uh, during this PhD course, I, I worked only biochemistry. I never worked in molecular biology, never genetics. So, uh, and I get a PhD. And after finishing PhD, I've been working in France, supervised with a Francis Sandre Warman professor. He's a professor. And in this stage, I learned molecular biology and genetics in France, not in Japan. And then I go back to the same laboratory at Oklahoma University. And I've been spent uh, several years as a postdoctor. And uh, from 20, 2019, I started working. I moved to the other institute in the same university, supervised with Michael Hippra and Wataru Sakamoto. My position is slightly, and uh, it's not a little bit different from the others. 
because uh, the Michel Hipra is also the, the professor in the University of Münster, Germany. So he is a cross appointment appointed professor. He, yeah, I mean the University of Münster, the Ukraine University, and uh, he's also my boss. <laughs> and uh, Wataru Sakamoto, he's a, a coordinator. He's working as a coordinator in our university, uh, in the institute, in this rector program. So for, and uh, also I belong to the Institute of Plant Science and Resources. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this is, uh, has some little, very little bit long distance from the main campus. So not so many students. So we are very happy if some undergraduate students apply to our university as a graduate student. So for the details, just so, uh, yeah, visit this homepage or just uh, the search uh, Google or uh, internet or the Okayama, Okayama University and the Daigakuin or something else. There's some funding to, to support the foreigners. So uh, just uh, yeah, submit the application. And uh, also the, I'm well, working with the Michel Professor Vector program. This is international program, research program, collaborating with Germany and, uh, and Japan and the other uh, countries, very worldwide. So this is also the, now running. So, but uh, the, today I will not uh, give some topics, it's a present work. So I, uh, some, the people, Do Dokne or something who, who invited me, I just uh, gave, me a, gave me an email. He told me that it seems um, many of uh, most of the audience is uh, undergraduate students and young researchers. Therefore, I want to tell the young researchers and uh, undergraduate students, this is a little bit philosophical. Balance of observation and interpretation is very important, I, I feel. So in this topic, the observation meaning that uh, we have to observe the data uh, obtained my experiment very carefully. And, uh, but uh, if you too much, uh, it's uh, become the, the work becomes uh, very descriptive. So which means uh, we need interpretation, precise interpretation is essential. But uh, of course, uh, the, if the too much interpretation, it becomes uh, overstate. It's not so science, but it is not science. So therefore the observation and the interpretation these two balance, it's important, I think. So, and uh, therefore, I think the non-biased uh, data observation, once we get uh, data, that is very important. And uh, of course, this kind of interpretation is supported by the high quality data set. So based on these philosophical manners, I want to tell the example from my two works my present previous works. So I would uh, present uh, these three articles to, to perform the two works. So one is the identification of a chemical species for A1 eucramnomonas. Uh, I, I, I would uh, explain in detail later. And the second topic is the chlamydomonas LHC1 subunit stoichiometry and arrangement. I did it. I will, I will explain these two topics today. So for the first topic, ah, oh, okay, before moving to the, the in, the, in the detail, I will briefly introduce about uh, my uh, organism. I will use uh, green algae, pyramid monas, right, happy. This is unicellular green algae. This is a, a photograph. You know, this is a 10 micrometer, roughly about a 10 micrometer oval shape, unicellular green algae. And uh, you know, the, this is green color, this is a chloroplast, which means that it's very easy to harvest and easy to accumulate the chloroplast protein. I mean, it's, it's very suitable for the biochemistry. And uh, also, we could manipulate the gene, this organism. It's very good to good uh, organism when the experiment. So I've been used this unicellular green algae, Chlamydomonas rhinhati, 
as a model of anything. So this is already a presented <laughs> already, but I, I will uh, briefly introduce but what's photosynthesis and what's the photosynthesis importance. So you know that we are animal, of course. So we may uh, execute the CO2 carbon dioxide. But uh, the, if the photosynthesis organism, it says a plant or algae on the diatom has not existed, uh, carbon dioxide will be accumulated. <laughs> and uh, of course, we consume the oxygen. So we could not respirate at all. So to survive in a, on, the, on this planet, plant and the, the photosynthesis organism is, is essential because the plant will metabolize carbon dioxide and emit oxygen. And in the same time, during this process, the plant will generate energy energy and uh, make fix uh, the carbon dioxide ultimately as a glucose. And this reaction takes place in, uh, this is a cell, uh, cell in the plant. Here you can see that this reaction takes place in the chloroplast. This is a special organism. If we magnify this chloroplast, uh, uh, the photosynthesis reactions, we could uh, distinguish two processes uh, light reaction and the non light reaction, let's say. The light reactions, all light reactions uh, that takes place, uh, the thyroid membrane embedded enzymes, which uh, make an electrochemical gradient under the illumination. And uh, during this electrochemical, uh, during the formation of the electrochemical gradient across thyroid membrane, of course, evolving above the uh, oxygen from the photosystem too. And uh, simultaneously, the electron transfers to the stroma. And uh, by using the, this proton gradient, which is formed between the the membrane, and by using the ATP, it has been formed. And uh, I would say the ATP and the electrons were formed, generated under the elimination from thyroid membrane. And these important factors uh, will be consumed to fix carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide has to be fixed the glyceraldehyde, the triphosphate at the end, and this compound is converted glucose at the end. So if you look at the very more precisely on the thyroid membrane, there are four essential uh, thyroid membrane embedded uh, protein complexes are there like this. So, so I'm working the photosystem. So there are two photosystems. The post, you know, the photosystem two uh, disrupt uh, throughout electrons from the water molecules and the, or both oxygen as a byproduct. And in the same time, the, of course, the proton will be released at lumen and the electron transfer reaction will take place from photosystem two to this direction. I mean, the photosystem one is a terminal of the electron transfer. Electrons transfer from here to here like this. And uh, of course, this electron transfer reaction, uh, light, I mean, the illumination is indispensable. By hitting the light, the photosystem one, the photosystem is it's, it's driven and the electron transfer reaction takes place. And uh, in the same time, the proton will transfer it, locate from stroma to lumen. At the end, uh, the luminal uh, pH, I mean, the proton concentration has been increased by using this proton gradient. I mean, the proton, high, high proton concentration has been consumed and then ATP is produced. And the electrons will transfer to ferredoxin. You know, the ferredoxin, electrons in the ferredoxin has been utilized for the various stromal enzymatic reaction. So let's say, I, 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 I would say photosystem too complex is just to evolve the oxygen. This is very important, but it's just a work to make the oxygen and uh, donate electron to the thyroid, you know? But the photosystem one complex will 
donate electron to the stroma enzymatic reaction, which means PS1, photosystem one complex electron transfer, is tightly connected together with stromal enzymatic reaction. So directly connect the stromal enzymatic reaction. So I, I think maybe the PS1 complex is more important, very, very important, actually, than the PS2. <laughs> that's, my, <laughs> that's why I'm working with the PS1. And uh, thanks to the, the structure biologist, now that uh, the PS3 is for protein complex structures has been resolved at atomic resolution with X-ray crystallography and the cryo EM structure technique. So now it becomes very clear. But uh, at the same time, uh, the, 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 this uh, structure information give us uh, some questions and some contradictory. <laughs> So PS1 structure has been resolved at 2.5 uh, Ohmstrom. It's very high. It can uh, determine the cofactors arrangement. Ah, so I, I forgot. Of course, the protein, protein itself cannot transfer the electrons. Because I mean, to, to, to make electron transfers, uh, there are some uh, cofactors should exist in the protein complexes. From, for example, this is plus signing as kind of uh, uh, proteins. To transfer these electrons, there are some essential cofactors, some uh, low molecular weight uh, uh, biomolecules as ligated in the protein complexes and uh, they work together to make electron transfer reaction. So that's it in the, these two, uh, important uh, crystal structure works results that how these cofactors, essential cofactors uh, align in the PS1 complex. So this, this historical uh, articles are very important to describe the cofactors. And uh, first, this one, 2001, this, this article, has been published using the cyanobacteria, and this is uh, it's been used with the plant. And uh, surprisingly, the electron transfer cofactor arrangement and the species, chemical species are the same, cyanobacteria and plant. So, which means uh, that everybody believe maybe the, the photosystem one electron transfer cofactors are the same in all photosynthesis organisms, they believe and the first. So uh, if you look at the more precise like this. So in the, about the 20 years ago, the uh, work, they resolved the cofactors like this. So uh, electrons transfers from this side, this side, and then uh, like this. So when we look at this one, but you see the phylokinome, this is a kind of uh, the electron transfer cofactors. So in the PS1 complex, ultimately there are two phylokinomes. So which means if we quantify the phylokinomes in the sample or purified PS1 complexes, we could estimate how many profiles or, or how many uh, photosystem one complexes are there in the thylakoid or in the plant cell or some cells. So that is a very important to quantify the how many pro, uh, fire genomes in the cell. But as self was, I did it experimentally. So that's a very easy, uh, yeah, maybe easy to imagine what happens. So just grow the chlamydomonas and uh, harvest the thyroid membrane and purify the, the photosystem one complex biochemically. And of course, to examine the cofactors, generally just extract the cofactors with uh, organic solvent. And this organic solvent has been uh, analyzed by the reverse phase calam chromatography. So this is very uh, educational. <laughs> so it's in the, generally the reverse phase calam chromatography to analyze as a 
very low uh, molecular weight uh, compounds such as chlorophyll or lutein or zansophyll or carotenoid like this. So in which the ODS, ODS has been attached to the, the silica regime and these very small particles are packed in the column and prepare this curve. And then when we apply the, the extracted one and then put some element to its organic compounds, so of course, this compounds, I mean, complicated mixtures have been separated according to the hydrophobicity of its individual pigment compounds. And then when we measure the absorption spectrum, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, these compounds are edited out depending on some time. And we could say the retain, retention time, hydrophobicity, it represents hydrophobicity. And of course, in the same time, we could measure the absorption spectra for individual compounds. So I did it, uh, but uh, we, first of all, we told Chlamydomonas, right? How did this is green algae also utilize phylokinone as did it in the plant or cyanobacteria. However, it was very difficult, uh, very, very low amount of fire genomes I found. Uh, yeah, and uh, also the, the, this, is, this approach is biochemistry, but the other approach that is rely on the biophysics, also it can give some other approach, we could get some answer. So even the biophysics, uh, we should have the same uh, result, but we have the contradict. Something wrong. So we, so I look at uh, some uh, some published article and I found it seems uh, some organisms utilize uh, menachinone for it's not menachinone. <laughs> so I doubt my <laughs> my biased knowledge is. And then if you look at the more carefully the experiment data, it seems this is the phylokinone addition step. And this is menachinone 4. And this is a chlamydomonas sample. You could see the barely detected the phylokinones. But uh, of course, menachinone 4 was there. And this one, unknown one, was here. So which means, and then if we get an absorption spectrum, it is very uh, same with ferroquinone and the menachinone 4, which means it seems uh, the chlamydomonas utilized uh, yeah, rather than the ferroquinone, but also made other compound. So collaborating with other uh, university and we determined uh, structure after purification of this uh, ferroquinone and uh, we concluded it seems chlamydomonas use uh, uh, this one. 5 prime monohydroxy phylokinone. Almost 90% of phylokinone should be this compound. And uh, only 10% they use phylokinone. So now that uh, we get the same, we got, we got the consistent results of the biophysics and the other uh, approaches. But uh, at that time, the nobody, nobody, nobody don't know this type of uh, results. And when we look at uh, the other organism, and uh, Eugrena, Brasidis, and uh, the other synecosystem system also get the same. But uh, these two organisms are already reported. They use five prime monohydroxy phylokinone. So I, I want to say that, that, that we have to observe more carefully. We have to, we have to not uh, interpret uh, with biased. So uh, the other one, the, the second topic, the sub geometry and arrangement. This is also some, somewhat very uh, complicated story. So uh, this is uh, the, the schematic shows the photosystem are complex. As I told you, the electron transfer reaction takes place in the, within the photosystem are complex. And in additionally, uh, peripheral sub this is which specialized on the light harvesting, which is called the light harvesting complex one. LSC1 is associate. And uh, the function of this LSC1 is just to increase the uh, capacity of the light energy. So thanks to the LSC1, uh, photosystem one complex, complex can utilize a more amount of light energy. 
So I, I would uh, briefly introduce about uh, the LSC1. So LSC1 consists of LSC1 subunits, many numbers of LSC1 subunits. And uh, also LSC1 subunits cannot function uh, as a monomer. All the time it functions as an oligomer, but uh, it has some unit structure. For example, in case of LSC2, which associated with PS2 functions all the time with trimer. And uh, in case of LSC1, which associates all the time PS1 with dimer. And uh, sometimes uh, in recently, the FCP, this is a diatom F uh, LSC, work as a tetramer in addition to dimer. So which means uh, LSC1 will make a dimer or a trimer and functions and uh, play a crucial role to harvest energy, light energy. And uh, the important point is, is uh, the LSC1 subunit, this is uh, it's highly conserved. Primary means amino acid sequence is highly conserved. And the secondary meaning the helix formation and the number of the helix and the arrangement is a tertiary structure. It's very, very highly conserved between the organism and the ice forms. But there's a slightly different between the, the helix. Therefore, the, the, when we uh, make a functional unit and when it uh, assemble together and to make the oligomers, becomes a variable quaternary structure. So, which means uh, the, it gives a different functions by assembling together, making a very big LSC1 oligomeric form. This is LSC1. So this is again, the structure has been resolved by uh, Israel group 2003. So this is very important and uh, very milestone structure. You could see the one, two, three, four, four LSC1 subunits associated with PS1 core. So everybody believed it seems uh, LSC1 should exist stoichiometrically. I mean the one to one ratio uh, with PS1 core. They believe at this time. Okay, and uh, also the the when we when I work in the Gramin monosterin Hadi. First of all, my question is how many numbers of genes in the Ramidomonas encoding LSC1 subunit. So it was uh, clear because there it seems there are nine genes in Ramidomonas and these nine genes uh, expressed all the time and associate with PS1 core. So at, at this time, it seems a different structure we, we could expect. Yes, I... it's a bit question yeah. and answer is very clear. But the uh, question is, uh, how these yeah. nine LSC1 subunits are arranged in chlamydomonas? You know, the, the plant has only four, but the chlamydomonas has more than double. That's so <laughs> the question is how they are. And, uh, but uh, everybody believe uh, the all LSC1 subunits are stoichiometrically yeah. one-to-one. One. Yes. Therefore, they present, propose previous works. You know, yeah. the one, two, three, four, I see them, eight, and like this. And this is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. So it's in the nine subunits are like this. So four subunits are like this. Just, uh, they, they believe the, the same structure with plant. And additionally, they put the five additional subunits like this. So the they, <laughs> they published works are already completely trapped with uh, the plant structure. Mm. So I think the uh, most uh, models which are so far published are completely biased mm. with uh, and trapped with the plant mm. structure. Mm. This is uh, the same for us. So we are completely uh, trapped with this biased view of this electron subject the stoichiometry and arrangement. But uh, our biochemical results uh, contradict to this result. So I'll show you. Oh, ah, yes. So again, that, that's a very easy experiment. I'll briefly into this. So uh, the question is how we could 
uh, quantify the stoichiometry of LHC one subunit or the others. So I used uh, the very old fashioned technique, uh, radio, auto radiogram. So the chromidome mass is a unicellular green algae. So we, if we put, the, this is the radio isotope. When we put stock, the, this radio isotope, we could label the all proteins with carbon 14. And uh, that's uh, let them grow. And the uh, all proteins are uniformly labeled carbon 14, because all proteins should have the carbon. And uh, here we, we care about the PS1 complex purified. And uh, we purified this complex and uh, separate polypeptides by this page. This is raw data, what I get. So after getting, of course, this is auto radiogram, we detected the beta ray signal coming from carbon 14. And uh, we, this is a density gram. So the this axis, X axis represents the migration profile and uh, the, this Y axis represents the intensity of the beta ray. So when we magnified this region, you could see this is LHA9. This here, LHA1 is, is high. And when we uh, divide the, the intensity by a carbon number, we could estimate the stoichiometry of the individual LHA for peptides, and this is the result. Well, yeah, we are very surprised. Only the LHA1 has almost twice, two, twice more the other. So now that, <laughs> that we have to reconsider about the, the arrangement and based on this stoichiometry, we get it. So the next step is how we determine uh, topology arrangement of LHA. So we use the, the chemical cross-linker. Chemical cross-link is like this, here is like this. So which can recognize the lysine residue and uh, which can cross-link the permanently. Like this. For example, if these proteins are adjacent neighbor, and when we will put chemical cross-link to the agent. Uh, some, some are chemically cross-linked and some are not escaped. And if we detect, after separation, as I told you, the chemically cross-linked products is permanently cross-linked for, by forming the covalent bond. So uh, the upshifted these two bands like this. So when we detect the antibodies against protein A and uh, against protein B, we detect, this is a before uh, cross-linked products, protein A and protein B, we could recognize like this, but uh, the Chemically cross-linked products are cross-linked and the bus shifted and the higher molecular weight. So in this uh, kind of experiment, uh, it is very important to generate the antibodies specific to individual LHCA. So that's why the, I, we did it, we made the antibody. And this is one example here. So this is one LHCA1 subunit here. And it, Minus represents uh, before putting the uh, chemical crosslink, crosslinker, and this is after chemical crosslink. And when we apply these uh, two samples individually and separate it and transfer to the membrane and detect it by using uh, LHA5 antibody, antibody against LHA5. And uh, this is the, of course, uh, the without chemical crosslinking, so which means this is authentic LHA5. After putting the chemical crossing, the, the, the some maybe 70% uh, of proteins uh, escaped from chemical crossing, but some are chemical crossing up shifted, we could find these two bands. So when we cut the membrane and uh, probed with the other antibody against the other LH1 subunit, and then when we compare the very carefully the electron mobility between the two. And then we could determine, for example, you could see the band nine, identical mobility, electron mobility, which means it seems LXA5 and the three forms dimer by putting the chemical cross linker, okay? And then when we repeat the same 
experiment uh, by using LSC6 antibody. In this example, again, the, the upper band we assigned. This band coming from the LSC5 and the 6 dimer by putting chemical cross-linking reaction. So when we repeat the uh, many, 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 many data set, and uh, in addition, we collaborated with Michel Fipra, and uh, in which he detected uh, the chemical cross-linked product by using mass spectrometry directly. At the end, uh, we collaborated with him. Many, many chemically cross-linked combinations was here, there, like this. And at the end, we get uh, this kind of diagram, many, many. Uh, and uh, at the end, we get a solution. So when we compare this structure, obtain structure and uh, the previous structure, let's compare these two. So first of all, so we, <laughs> the previous works uh, are based on the one-to-one -one ratio stoichiometry. So therefore they put the one, two, three, four, that's okay. But they put the five LSU subunits like this. But uh, actually, this is a four, even the outer being like this. And uh, that's a, this model, this model is coming from the biophysics, the right side. But uh, the, they don't have any uh, biochemical evidence, but uh, we get. It seems that LSC2 and 9 is opposite. This is a, our original uh, biochemically obtained uh, arrangement at that time. So this structure has been confirmed by a cryo EM analysis on uh, two years ago. So at the end, uh, we get uh, LSC as a former two layers, LSC1 is here, four and four. But uh, it seems that it's a little bit strange because as I told you, the LSC1 structures, individual, I mean the monomer LSC1 is very conserved. But by resolving this cryo EM structure, we found these dimers Dimer dimer is the same, but uh, this dimer 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 formation making a tetrama is slightly expanded. We found it as a crime EM analysis. That's why uh, there's no problems. There's no uh, five. Just uh, they put uh, four relations up in it. Has been confirmed by crime EM. So finally, I would. Uh, Tell the uh, students and the young researchers, I would, I would leave the, the message. So through this, my uh, research, uh, do not believe the previous works without consideration. Have to think, have to think, have to think. And uh, all the time preliminary experiment is essential just to confirm. But for example, you may, when, you, when you read the article, I, in, my, in my mind, it is very important to confirm to whether the, the result is reproducible by yourself or not. And uh, based on the experiment, it is very important to reconsider all hypotheses. Yeah, and I know the LSC1 subunit arrangement and the stoichiometry was also the hypothesis at that time before, before, before my, my work. So we have to consider very carefully uh, hypothesis and uh, confirm it by, my, by yourself with experiments. And uh, I think the most important point to observe your data more carefully. Sometimes the uh, data is uh, misleading and uh, sometimes uh, you, you made a mistake or something. <laughs> so I think this very important point is you have to carefully do this experiment and uh, discuss with other people more, much more. Okay, thank you very much. That's all my talk. Thank you very much.
that's a uh, make uh, okay. some question or comments yes sir thank you thank you <laughs> dr ozo thank you very much uh, um, just uh, i seen why you choose the that photo system one <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is uh, uh, you are donating this particular it is a electron donor <laughs> and you are donating this particular knowledge to the undergraduate students this is a very important things for the students that on the basis of the preliminary idea that uh, how should we have to work that students should be keep in the mind that while working any particular preliminary things gives the mm. idea for the mm. the advanced work uh, thank you very much uh, any uh, questions from the student side yes sir yes sir i have one question Yes, yes. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, myself, Tushar, sir. Uh, Are you Tushar? <laughs> yeah. uh, sir, my question is uh, to Dr. Ozawa. Sir, yeah. when yes. uh, we, uh, sir, when uh, we apply herbicides or weed sites on a plant, which uh, activity? Uh, 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 hmm? Sorry, pardon. After 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 applying any herbicide or yes, sir. Uh, what yes. actually happens with the photo system? Which of people? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Sorry, I could not hear. <laughs> yes, a... again, again, Tush Dr. Tushan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, mm. I am repeating. Uh, sir, mm. I am repeating here. Mm. After applying mm -hmm. any herbicides or weed sites, what actually happens with the photo system one? Ah, herbicide. Huh. Yeah, after herbicide. applying herbicides, herbicides or weed sites that affect the photosynthesis. Yes, so, exactly. So mm. In photosystem one, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, subunit or which uh, dimer is affected first? A uh, very very famous one is methyl bio biogen. Methyl biogen is a paracoat or something. It's very effectively blocks electron transfer from photosystem one to stromal side. It is very famous. And the mercury chloride will also block. <laughs> it's a kind of very uh, famous uh, herbicide, specifically target photosystem one. But uh, the, you know, the paracord also uh, blocks the respiratory, <laughs> respiratory reaction. So I am saying maybe it is very difficult to, to block the photosystem one electron transfer. Specifically, as far as I know. Mm. Otherwise, uh, another uh, strategy you could uh, block the electron transfer from B6 cell to PS1 by putting the DB, DBMIB, which will block the B6 cell to PS1. So, which can block the photosystem electron transfer indirectly. That's as a herbicide, what I could uh, provide you. It's a. Uh, it's okay for your question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Why did she ask? She eyes. And the other is. Uh, How is there? Hmm? Yes. What's the answer? It was very nice to hear okay. you, Dr. Ozawa, sir. Whatever yes. the baseline guidelines you have provided and the message you have given to the young genine researchers it was very fantastic. Now, uh, Dr. Maude, sir, is there? Maus is, uh, uh, I could not find. <laughs> yes, yes, I think yes. there is a technical problem with uh, Dr. Maude, sir. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now, he has been invited mm. for his uh, presidential talk, no? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh. 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 Oh.
okay now may i invite dr pankaj uh, choudhary sir for the uh, vote of thanks to propose the vote of thanks the okay thank you okay can can stop sharing okay thank you <laughs> any back. question <laughs> from the students sir 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 maruti sir कारण लाइन गॉरीटेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम नाउ मे आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर सतीश मारुदे सर फॉर हिज प्रेसिडेंशियल एड्रेस सर ओवर टू यू सर ओके ओके या 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 सॉरी बिकॉज जस्ट आई हेव सीन द डिफरेंट पर्टिकुलर रिसर्च in the field mm. of the physiology yeah. but uh, this particular work uh, you are doing as a young researchers uh, for the undergraduate it is a um, very important for the undergraduate as well as the post graduate students also because as uh, we know that the physiology the subject as uh, it is not a one particular subject it is related with the biochemistry yes it is related with the biophysics it is a just like the we can go to see it is a life science subject because uh, it is a interlinked uh, particular subject as uh, you have to study the particular photosystem one but mm. in this particular photosystem one uh, that is how this particular life harvesting complex is in the life harvesting complex how this particular electron transport chain is that one the students should be able to know that the best things uh, they should be able to know that that the, the photosystem one membrane protein complex uh, found in all the oxygenic uh, the photosynthetic organisms that uses the light this particular light to transfer the electrons from phytocyanin to the peroxin this particular the basic things uh, is that the light energy captured this particular antenna in the form of the chlorophyll transferred rapidly to the primary uh, donor electron that is the p700 but in this particular uh, same uh, as the 30% of this particular the uh, oxygen in the atmosphere this particular cyanogenic uh, 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 we can spoke organisms like the algae that uses this particular the o2 this uh, particular o2 is going to be used and uh, in this particular the um, research it is uh, we have to understand the complex nature of the research that uh, there you have to know the mass of that particular the complexes how there is a interlinking is going to be formed if you going to be see that the biophysical of the um, or the um, biochemical process that finally converting into the solar energy in the chemical energies this particular how this uh, split water molecules to the oxygen that students able to know you have uh, deliver in a very nice way that uh, i think that the undergraduate students uh, know this particular how the research uh, should be you are uh, working in a very great lab because uh, you are the professors they are working and they are guiding you uh, as a researchers uh, at that time it definitely uh, will be able to solve this particular problems uh, in the near future as uh, while discussing the things also you are given as the how the research programs for the undergraduate how the financial assistance you are given the link that is a very helpful uh, for the budding uh, students also <laughs> but yes. uh, how, how the mass spectroscopy because uh, this particular the mass spectroscopy the students are going to be do the able to know the mass of the any particular the uh, the complex 
but uh, for the interpretation of these particular things, it is very difficult to interpret the things as whether uh, that cross-linking is going to form or not, what should be the mass, whether that particular compound is the purified compounds are there or not. This particular things has to uh, take into the consideration as uh, this particular um, in the development of this uh, cryo electron microscopy is the uh, another uh, particular things that uh, should be able to know that the students uh, that recent things regarding the cyanobacteria and uh, you have covered all the primary primary basic aspects uh, of this particular photosystems i am very thankful to you on the behalf of my side also <laughs> for this particular nice lecture that uh, definitely uh, uh, certain things uh, should be coming up uh, in the near future. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, again, I am very thankful uh, to this particular Sir Rukmini Arts Commerce College, um, that sauna. It is a very rural college because uh, I visited a uh, few uh, years back and the progress uh, they have made uh, in this particular direction. They have um, making this particular international conference uh, today, it is in a very successful manner. I'm very thankful uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Lay, principal of this particular series, uh, Victor yeah. Rukmini, First Commerce College, uh, as well as I'm very thankful to the Vinay Rao Patil Sondikar. That is a, uh, uh, this uh, I also met uh, with him in the last uh, meeting. Thankful to you, sir. I'm also thankful to the convener that Dr. Swati Tathod, Professor Sheikh Bilal, IPC coordinator, Dr. RN Ingole for chairing this particular function. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, Thank so. You, sir, for your excellent remark. Thank you, sir, for your excellent remark on the Genine lecture of Dr. Ozawa. Now, Thank you. for concluding this session, may I request Dr. Pankaj Choudhury, sir, for his vote of thanks. Dr. Pankaj Choudhury. Pankaj Choudhury. Thank you, madam. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to uh, all on behalf of organizing team. It's my privilege to propose vote of thanks on this international conference. I would like to thank chairperson Dr. S. N. Marode, Government Institute of Science and Humanities, Amrauti, who honored this session with this providing thought. I would like to express our deep gratitude and respect for distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Sin Ichiro Ozawa, IPSR Okoyama University, Japan, for not only sparing their invaluable time, but also for enlightening us with their commandable talk on the subject. You have indeed put the best of your effort to make this conference memorable event. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Tathod Madam for conducting the session wonderfully of this conference. Last but not the least, our believe audience for making this conference as a grand success. Once again, I thank one and all present in virtual international conference. Thank you. Now thank is the time for 15 minute tea break. We'll gather over again sharp 11.45 for next session. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir.
Hello.
Du kommer bare ikke. Hello, Pankaj. Yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Good morning, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Thank you, sir. Uh, after a tea break, we are in our uh, next uh, session. Okay. Uh, I, Dr. Pankaj Choudhury, uh, welcome to you all uh, for the se uh, session two. On the behalf of entire VRC fraternity, uh, I would like to welcome all the dignitaries and uh, invitees for the session two. Let me first welcome the president of today's event as well as the chief guest and chairperson with the words and request them to occupy the respective seats on the dais. Welcome, sir. Welcome, ma'am, and welcome all the participants and all the students. Now I take the opportunity to introduce our chairperson for the invited talk or keynote address of Dr. V.K. Gupta, sir. It gives me an image to introduce our today's chairperson, Dr. U.S. Deshmukh, ma'am. Okay. Hello, Pankaj, you are not audible. Uh, okay, ma'am. Right, right now, I am audible, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, now I take an opportunity to introduce our chairperson for uh, the keynote address of Dr. V.K. Gupta. For that, we have Dr. U.S. Deshmukh ma'am with us. It's my pleasure to introduce you, ma'am. Uh, uh, it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce our today's chairperson, Dr. U.S. Desh Deshmukh ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of Zoology, Government with the Institute of Science and Humanities, Amrauti. Dr. Deshmukh ma'am did her master and PhD in zoology from Santa Gargi Baba Amrauti University, Amrauti. She having 18 years of experience in various domains like teaching, research, administration, and execution of projects. Her research area covers arachnology and toxicology. Dr. U.S. Deshmukh ma'am published about more than 40 publications for leading national and international journals and attended a number of conferences in the field of science and technology. Ma'am has delivered expert talk on various topics through the seminar, webinar, and conferences in her area of expertise. Dr. Deshmukh ma'am has confirmed with the Senior Young Scientist Award and Gold Medal for the Best Paper Presentation by DSP, FRST, and UGC SAP Gurukil Kangra Vishwavidyalaya Haridwar in 2017. Best Paper Presentation in National Symposium on Recent Trends in Life Sciences organized by the University of Mumbai. She also awarded with the Best Paper Presentation Award in 96th Indian Science Congress organized by the Northeastern University, Shillong, Meghalaya. She is serving as an associate editor and reviewer for many international referred journal books and bulletins of toxicology and physiology, keeping in view her vast experience in the area of, in the area, Biodiversity Management Board Amrauti elected Ma'am as an executive member. Ma'am has guided many UG and PG uh, dissertations and projects. Under her supervision, six MPhil 
and uh, four PhD students were awarded their respective degrees, and three students were, were working under her supervision. We have a great honor to have uh, you today, ma'am, with us, and I request uh, you to chair the session and introduce our today's keynote speaker, Dr. V.K. Gupta, with your golden word. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pankaj, for your uh, um, introduction. Now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. V. K. Gupta, sir. Uh, he is recently working as an assistant professor of zoology, CMD, postgraduate college, Bilaspur, Chhattisgarh, India. He has completed his MSc, MPhil, and DSc from the France. He is having uh, teaching experience, undergraduate and postgraduate classes, more than 41 years. Field of interest of the, this fellow is origin of life. Uh, he is investigating constitution, uh, construction of biometric uh, uh, protocell like microstructures in the laboratory uh, simulated uh, atmosphere. Uh, he is awarded with a French government scholarship for two years and visited several laboratories uh, in uh, different countries. France, Germany, USA, hello, 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 am I audible? Hello, sir. Hello, am I audible, sir? Y yes, sir, yes, sir. you are audible. Uh, maybe there is some technical uh, problem with uh, this man's. Uh, yes, yes, my end also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let, let me start. Uh, sir, uh, give, me, give me a minute. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Nice. Nice. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Sorry yes. for technical glitch. Uh, Doctor Deshmukh, ma'am, uh, will resume very soon. Oh no, no, no. Uh, there yes. is some technical issue with her. Uh, mm. uh, we all know that in the uh, means uh, in uh, live or virtual conferences that problems are happened. Yes. Uh, for that, uh, I feel regret uh, from the fraternity of ERC. No, no need to. <laughs> sorry, sir. Hello, Pankaj. If there is interruption at that end, if you permit, we can start. Hello, Dr. Pankaj. Hello, uh, Hello Doctor. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, with the permission of Dr. U.S. Deshmukh, ma'am, uh, we may now proceed to our uh, further uh, invited talk. So, uh, on the behalf of uh, our president, I request uh, uh, Dr. V.K. Gupta, sir, uh, to share his valuable talk with us. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Pankaj.
Thank okay. you very much. Okay, okay, okay. So good morning to all of you. It was very fascinating experience when I received invitation by the organizing committee for this multidisciplinary seminar on new horizons of science and technology in the present century. But may I share my presentation? Can you see my screen, Ankas? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Is it visible? Okay, very nice. So, innovations in post genomic era and emergence of new biology. When I thought what, on what topic I should speak on, when the organizing committee is inviting me to speak in a multidisciplinary topic, considering the prospects of biological sciences with the effect in the perspective of the science and technology, you see in 21st century, there are three kingdoms. There are plants, there are animals, and there are machines. So in 21st century, that is the post-genomic era, we are living in the age of man-machine symbiosis. I forgot to say, um, say hello to Ujwala, madam. We have a very long association with her. Yes. Hello, madam. And uh, Honorable Principal, Professor Mohale. Very nice activity. So. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning, madam. Good morning. So nice. We have a very sweet uh, Good memory of you. Um, so. Um, we are, uh, we are having three kingdoms at the moment. We have animals, we have plants, and we have machines. And we are living in the age of man-machine symbiosis. We all know that the biogenic elements are scattered throughout the cosmos. It was a very enlightening address to hear from Professor Yadav uh, in the beginning key, uh, keynote address. And he has rightly said that the plants are the living gods on the earth, all the living systems on the earth, they are energy transducing units. They are very important for the energy transduction and every living system on the earth is equally respected, should be equally respected. So when we talk about evolution, Nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And in 21st century, uh, I was happy to hear a talk by Eisen Goldenfield. Uh, he, he was the student of the uh, one of the Nobel laureate, Carl Goos. And he, in that talk, he mentioned that the today, biology at crossroads. Because these developments in science and technology, they are moving at a such a faster rate that the symbiosis is happening and a new biology is coming up. New biology, exploring new potentialities, our new understanding towards nature. So the various branches of sciences, the environment, molecules, DNA, RNA, cells, and everything we are acquainted with. So new biology, we are addressing the problems 
we have started in 21st century about the uh, understanding about the genetic systems using more concepts about the population biology problems of cell biology and tools of biochemistry molecular biology alone so new biology needs a different story about genomics bioinformatics evolutionary genetics and a novel um, explanations for the uh, undermined biology so this is the future we are heading towards so now man is a tool making animal and we have learned during this period that biology is a technology first bacterial genome synthesized from the scratch and technologically the first data describing the energetic and the carbon cost of wide spread wide field use first stable programming of plant cells using artificial chromosomes first demonstration of embryonic systems derived from the nuclear transfer so engineering perspective of biology is coming up and it is more deeper more evigorating the presentation of reality is called for today we are in need of science that shows us a way and engineering biology might still show some how to get there it is just not don't know where there is so we may have in our department bioengineering department in future so biological technologies are going to change our both economy and interaction with nature in new ways and the new biology includes the diverse branches of the modern biological sciences genetic engineering cloning transgenics gene therapy assisted reproductive technologies ivf et super revolution tissue culture proteomics bioeconomical approach and eco sustainable efforts so in light of this new biology an integrative approach towards biological sciences is coming up i want to emphasize a new science looking at the integrative approach of the biological system is the systems biology we know the different level of organization we have the gene we have the genome network single cell physiology and the multi cell physiology etc and all putting together we have a holistic approach towards the biological system and that is the systems biology so we are in the 21st century we are studying a biological system through the angle of systems biology integrated because living phenomena it is the integrated outcome of all these processes so it is going to give us an holistic uh, understanding about the biological system in nature we can see the different components we have a cell and the you know the the ultra structure of cell is so complex we have the uh, nuclear Uh, content cytoplasmic content and cell itself it is a complete organism and we know that all the uh, genetic information conserved in the cell uh, how it is uh, transcribed how it is translated how it is uh, inherited and mutated and new organisms are being synthesized so immense uh, potentialities are there these are the complex metabolic pathways of a cell we can know that how complex the pathways are the this is the so but these all these pathways are integrated in a wonderful manner and outcome of their integrated functions is the living phenomenon when these pathways are integrated the system shows multiplication they grow in size and they show various metabolic activities that is the properties of biological order so it is a wonderful system how in how nature is um, integrating these complex processes and 
showing the expression of various properties of biological order. So recent studies have revealed that the genomics, proteomics, systems biology have potentiality to study cell as a system. It is a complete organism. However, it has become generally accepted that the integrative analysis of function of the multiple gene products has become a critical issue for the future development of biology. We can see that in uh, genetic engineering, we have the individual and we have the reproductive germinal cells are there. They are the genetic uh, components carrying the genetic information, how this information is replicated, how it is transcribed and uh, cells are duplicated. We all know about it. So the genes in course of evolution, the evolution of gene is going on. But in course of evolution, people often ask that what is getting evolved, whether it, it is the matter or it is the information contained in the matter. It, because the matter is the hardware and the information is getting processed through this uh, evolutionary process. So new biology is also leading towards synthetic biology where the various biological components or the biogenic molecules uh, are uh, simulated in laboratory conditions and they form the artificial cells, then the tissues and the, it is going on. And a lot of molecules have been uh, simulations have been done in laboratory. The computer assisted simulation, computer models are there, and the artificially organisms are being created in laboratory, and they are being um, genetically modified organisms are being released into the environment. So you can see the biotechnological consequences. We have the we can modify the genome, we can design the organism. We can create the clones, and this is the future we are passing through. The clones, genes are being transcribed, designed, modified as per the preferred choices, and the new organisms are being created and released into the environment. You must be knowing this is the Dolly Don, sheep and the various clones of various organisms. We have the transgenics where we can see the mixing of genes. You can see the uh, uh, transgenic mice, transgenic crops are there, and some uh, habitization experiments are going on, some in vitro fertilization. So mixing of genes is going there. So new science is coming up when artificially we can create new genetic order in nature. So germline, uh, another transgenic experiments and cloning in various laboratories of the world it is going on. So all of us, we are carrying uh, so many defective genes are with us. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is uh, perfectly fit. Everybody is carrying so many defective genes with us. So genes can be repaired. They can be corrected for a better future. So this is a novel invention of 21st century. So um, synthetic biology is doing wonders in various areas, synthesizing uh, biological molecules in laboratory simulated conditions. These are the artificial cells. I have been working on these systems. I'm, basically, I'm working on origins of life. And we are synthesizing these cells uh, in laboratory, utilizing some in, 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 in photochemical mechanism. We prepare a mixture of a sterilized aqueous mixture of some. We, we take some inorganic organic chemicals expose it to 
it is a splice across picture exposed to sunlight and on radiation in radiation with the sunlight we get photochemical formation of this type of microstructures they are uh, spherical in shape you can see they can multiply by budding they can grow by on photochemical exposure to sunlight and they show multiplication but they are not living they are organomolecular structures and we have analyzed the presence of various abiogenesis uh, 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 of biochemicals in these systems we have uh, synthesized abiogenesis uh, of amino acids photochemical synthesis of amino acids which are present in free as well as in peptide combination they have a definite boundary wall I, I don't I don't want to go in much detail but they have a limiting boundary wall which is simply the scanning which helps in uh, the um, uh, charge separation uh, and uh, it was very enlightening to hear professor shin he talked about peridoxin and i would like to add that recently we have uh, used a different level of oxidized sulfur and introduced peridoxin like material in this, these systems and in uk in one of the lab we were testing the photocatalytic activity of these systems that they can uh, decompose water uh, utilizing sunlight as a source of energy because these systems has a membrane for charge separation peridoxin like material uh, for electron transfer reaction so they are quite interesting from that point of view and we presume that that in the primitive atmosphere the, the it is just a simulation experiment in primitive atmosphere and possibly the earliest energy transducing system they catalyzed the photochemical transformation in prebiotic and led to the emergence of living system on this earth so the work is in progress but it is outcome of the synthetic biology experiments large number of genetically modified organisms are being created in various laboratories of the world we have fruits we have the crops and the various things are getting changed in light of this biotechnological and genetic engineering experiments we can see the germline therapy and all those things we can modify and create the desired systems in a novel way so the major advances dependent on animal researches are uh, these are the i will not read it but it has a vast very diverse scope in different fields of uh, biological research but in all experiments i want to it is just a wake up call that we need to consider the ethical basis of this experimentation so biology is the science which is concerned with the normal structure and function of living things at the various levels of the organization and the medical science usually incorporates the biochemistry physiology pharmacology and medicine but ethics some kind uh, we call it as a moral philosophy and it is concerned with how we should decide that what is right and what is wrong so hemingway used to say that what is moral and what you feel good after what is immoral what you feel bad after so bioethics is very important nowadays we have to we should have some ethical considerations for our experimentation and ethics just like a bridge it is a bridge between present and the future it is a bridge between science and values it is a bridge between nature and culture bridge between man and the nature so the, these are the various areas of bioethical issues animal rights and so many we have a long list because in every area our science and technology have come to a stage where we have to take some ethical decision whether it is the atomic energy nuclear energy or the manipulation of genetic material in every places ethics is the prime concern we have to take into consideration 
the animal ethics and the bioethics for the welfare of humanity. These are the various areas. Every part of human quest is getting affected. At every moment, we have to take some uh, ethical decision that we should do it or not do it. Because it is, which is going to shape the future of humanity on this earth. These are the very prominent issues, organ transplantation, assisted reproductive technologies, sex determination, abortion, female foticide, women rights, control of uh, population containment, nutrition, drinking water, etc. So uh, our future depends on our on our biological consideration, bioethics, the values. So ethics and science are related because values are intrinsic to science. Without values, we can't have a good science. So ethics and technology are related because the values, they shape our technology. They shape technological choices and they determine who gains, who loses through the impact of technology on society. So bioethics is very, very important. Firstly, ethics and values are distinct and elements of our cultural identity and our pluralistic civilization. I would like to read a, a small part from the essay titled Tapovan from the famous Indian author Tagore. The contemporary Western civilization is built on brick and wood. It is rooted in the city, but Indian civilization has been distinct in locating its source of regeneration, material, and the intellectual in, in the forest, not only not on, in the city. Our, in the forest, not only the India's best ideas have come from the man and was, when, was in communion with the trees, rivers, lakes, from the clouds. The peace of the forest has helped the intellectual evolution of man. The culture of forest has fueled the culture of Indian society. The culture that had arisen from the forest has been influenced by the diverse processes of renewal of life which are always at play in the forest, varying from species to species, from season to season, in sight and sound and smell, unifying principle of life, diversity of democratic pluralism, thus became the principle of Indian civilization. So that is the essence related in a very decent way. So the compassion is the main uh, idea behind the uh, bioethics and the concern for other species, as the Professor Yada was talking, that other species is very, very indigenous to our pluralistic culture. It is the coexistence that is going to save us. And the bioethics builds on our indigenous civilization. So, how to improve safety and security in bioeconomic? to come. So we have to take some moral decisions. We have to decide about the, um, the trends of the scientific researches, about the medical researches, and the animals are getting replaced uh, in laboratories by some alternative means. So there are serious and wide-ranging issues concerning bioethics, for example, the cloning, the stem cell research, fertilization, prenatal identification of genetic disorders, advances made by implications in various areas, including political decisions. So it is a great thing. So biology is very profoundly affecting the whole scenario our ecosystem. So humans are important. And let us, uh, if I ask you that humans are more important than other animals, 
there are uh, as per use animals should have equal right with humans animals should be treated with more consideration than as they have no way to complain so in our constitution also uh, the uh, article 51 a g states that it shall be duty of every citizen of india to protect and improve the natural environment including the forests lakes rivers wildlife and to have compassion for all living creatures in section 17.1 the prevention of cruelty of animals so similarly the our wildlife conservation act amended from time to time and uh, ask for conservation so the essence is the coexistence now recently we have seen that uh, in this uh, 21st century the uh, we are living in a hybrid uh, symbiotic society and where the machines Uh, are imitating imitated biomics are being created in laboratories large number of biomics are, are in uh, functional state as a biology and electronics so biomics it is a mimicking and applying the biological system and its integrate functioning to machines and robots we all know that in our within 5 next 5 to 10 years our Um, all decisions regarding our welfare will be taken by machines whether it is the operation or some other welfare because uh, some the advances in the area of artificial intelligence and the cognitive abilities of the computer systems machine learning everything is changing so fast so bionics bionics are referred as a flow of ideas from biology to engineering and vice versa so the biological sciences are having a great future towards engineering and vice versa then we are going to have a potent biology for a sustainable society so the central principle in biodynamics is learning from the nature that is the essence nature is the supreme engineer if we learn from nature then we will be able to create a sustainable uh, system and use our biological information to to for uh, sustainable living uh, a large number of uh, examples are available bats are their bioluminescence artificial neuron network evolutionary computation cell to cell communication implants to cure deafness development of microchip to restore vision of retina so in silico uh, large number of uh, software programs are available through computer simulation in vivo and in vitro uh, drug testing and the uh, artificial uh, simulations in laboratory for the animal studies are being actively pursued nowadays so system biology has given a noble a uh, novel insight to have a holistic view of and the, uh, about the potentiality of biological systems so in large number of applications of bionics these are the bionic insects artificially created by digital mechanisms they 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 have they have they have been inspired from nature micro robots very soon they will be crawling in your smart homes to fulfill your various needs and so all design is inspired by nature you have bionic hand uh, recently in uh, Imperial Museum in UK. I've seen the uh, replica of a bionic man. This is here is a bionic eye. A small camera is there. 
and the, that uh, specimen was wearing a tissue compatible shirt. The, 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 they are the solar insects with many legs. They are uh, very sensitive to photons and they can uh, use the photonic energy and uh, they can crawl. So, the moral basis for the enhanced sustainability the bio geo resources, the total, if we consider the holistic approach that we have to, uh, we are worried about the natural resources, renewable as well as non-renewable, man-made resources, for example, education, currency, medicine, thirdly, the human resource, nature and quality of people, and attitude of the consumers, values, norms, and morals, and in the area of environmental ethics. The emphasis has been laid on the two large ecosystems, marine bio and the forest ecosystems. So, Dr. Yadav has covered in a very nice way, and he has emphasized that the plants are the living god autotrophic systems and how how so this is the future we are facing this is homo futurus and this is an art from odisha museum so stephen hawkins the famous physicist who talked about black holes, he said, Earth is in much danger from human action than natural disasters. This is not a prediction of doom, but a wake-up call. We have to recognize the dangers and control them. I am optimist. I believe we can. In Indian philosophy, also we say, that hum sab ke bhitar jo sundar hai mujhe uske upar vishwas hai ki agar hum usko follow karenge to hamara bhavish prithvi par zarur bana rahega so we are in 21st century we are going to have a new era of responsibility responsibility uh, recognition that we have duties to ourselves our nation and the world to have a sustainable, if the message is coexistence, we have to conserve it. So we are all ignorant from different perspectives. So our answers to our all problems of the world, they lie in education. And I congratulate the organizer, especially Professor Mahale and his team of the college. And they have organized such a nice academic activity uh, to enlighten and, and, the, and, the, and the purpose was very justified because it considered the multi-dimensional approach. It was an, it, it, in the total impact is the holistic approach towards the biological system. So it was so nice to hear the learned speakers and I thank you very much for giving me a chance to express my views before the learned academic fraternity and thank you very much for the honor given to given for this through this academic activity. Thank you very much, sir. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your precious experiences in the field of cell biology. Today we are revealed the concept of new biology in front of uh, all of us. Uh, apart from traditional biology, how we recross the and we uh, correlate the biology with other subjects. Uh, you explained very well. Uh, it's really great ex uh, experience. Uh, your talk took us back to our college days and uh, brighten our memories of our college life. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Yuvan Deshmukh, ma'am, uh, for her presidential uh, talk. Uh, before that, uh, uh, sorry. Before that, if you have any kind of query, you may ask to the uh, Dr. V uh, Vikay Gupta, sir. Uh, the session is open for the discussion.
regarding his talk if you have any kind of query you may ask to gupta sir and i think there is no queries are there <laughs> yeah such lecture is crystal clear ma'am <laughs> there is no query from uh, participant side uh, so uh, without testing your curiosity i would like to invite dr deshmukh ma'am uh, for her presentation uh, over to you ma'am okay uh, thank you pankaj uh, i am very much thankful to dr vk gupta sir uh that uh, for this a uh, very nice and informative lecture so we have been uh, acquainted with the advanced knowledge uh, regarding innovations in biology uh, it's a very good uh, lecture sir uh, you also discuss regarding the technological aspects of biology from uh, first bacterial genomics uh, you also discuss regarding the systems of biology as the genes genome a network or the single cell physiology likewise uh, also discuss about it, it integral functions of a complex processes uh, he also talk about the major advantages in the medications or the medis, medical field also uh, bioethics uh, was uh, definitely a issue nowadays regarding various uh, factors when we Uh, see about um, medical uh, problems and these are uh, definitely to be considered uh, so uh, whatever the moral uh, physiology or the bioethics uh, you talk about is uh, really very good or uh, informative uh, bioethical issues as you especially discuss of which the female feticide uh, or the woman right uh, child problem child right uh, problems Uh, likewise these are really the uh, current and the very important issues they are to be considered uh, ethics and the technology as uh, they are the important for culture and so this is uh, really a one of the um, important factor uh, you also discuss about the guidelines uh, under the various sections uh, which are uh, regarding the uh, conservation and the coexistence of the human and the animal or the forest so that is also uh, very much uh, important in the discussion uh, then uh, regarding the principle of bio uh, bioethics uh, that is uh, learning from nature really we everything learn from the nature only we do not uh, appreciate the nature uh, that is the major problem but uh, how uh, nature uh, inspires for using and uh, modifying our technology uh that is uh, important uh, finally you also say that is earth is uh, in major danger from uh, human action rather than the uh, natural disasters this is also a fact uh, so uh, whenever uh, we think about the bionics uh, it is uh, important that we have to respect aparanti to open dil tere ata majha bhashan nahi Uh, so uh, gupta sir this is really a very nice lecture the the uh, uh, informative uh, aspects of the bionics thank you thank you very much finally i would like to uh, congratulate uh, all the team of this uh, e conference uh, and uh, inviting me for uh, uh, as a chair person for this session thank you thank you very much over to pankaj thank you ma'am uh, thank you very much ma'am for accepting our invitation it's my uh, pleasure here uh, to uh, because we both are my mentors and my guide uh, it's my pleasure uh, to compare the session uh, for your side thank you ma'am uh, now thank, thank you. you thank you madam for your kind remarks thank, thank you, you. Now, <laughs> we are in a concluding format for that uh, i would like to convey uh, you know i uh, uh, anil khade sir to propose the vote of thanks uh, over to you anil sir thank you sir good afternoon to one and all uh, i would i would like to say a uh, thank to organizing committee of this conference uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to offer a vote of thanks for this session firstly i would like to thank uh, chairperson of today's session honorable uh, dr yom 
us uh, deshmukh madam associate professor in government institute of science and humanities amravati for us uh, gracious presence in today's session with her valuable suggestions she has been beautifully introduced uh, to the resource person of this session of the international conference i once again uh, say thank you ma'am kindly presence for the session next one i would like to express deep sense in my gratitude vote of thanks to dr vk gupta sir pm dubey pg college uh, bilaspur chatisgarh resource person of the session very uh, well known as an eminent academic academician thank you sir thank you so much then i would like to thank dr pankaj choudhary sir for conducting uh, this session and uh, introducing today's chairperson last but not the least my hearty thank goes to goes out for those who have contributed directly or indirectly in smooth functioning of this top session of international conference now i invite uh, mr gaurav kale sir to conduct uh, for the session thank you very much good afternoon to all uh, our keynote speaker is not there uh, that's why uh, the session will start at uh, 12:45 so everyone join at 12:45 down to
मतलब पूजा में Hi. Good morning. Yep. Good afternoon to all of you. I warmly welcome all respected delegates, faculties, research scholars, and dear students for the second day, third session of the international conference. myself mr gaurav kale assistant professor and head of the department physics for this session we have the guest of honor dr badwaik sir i i welcome dr badwaik sir as a chairperson and dr durga prasad rathke sir as a plenary speaker i request to dr badwaik sir please occupy the chair as a chairperson thank you sir thank you thank you sir now it gives me an immense pleasure to introduce respected dr dilip badwaik sir dr dilip badwaik sir working as a principal of kamla nehru mahavidyalay nagpur which is affiliated with rashtra sant tukloji maharaj nagpur university nagpur dr badwaik sir received phd in physics from rtmnu nagpur university in 1999 and has 32 years teaching experience at ug and pg level he is active member of board of studies rtmnu university dr badwai is supervisor in physics sir excellent research credentials reflect by his research paper published in various reputed national and international journals and have nearly 10 phd students under him out of the some student received phd degree now i am going to hand over the session to the chair person dr badwaik sir please chair the session thank you dev gaurav am i audible to all of you yeah you are yeah thank you sir thank you mr gaurav for nice introduction first i congratulate principal of shri विठल रुक्मिणी महाविद्यालय एंड ऑर्गनाइजिंग कमिटी मेंबर्स ऑफ दिस नेशनल ई कॉन्फरेंस ऑन न्यू हॉरिजॉन्स एंड मल्टी डिसिप्लिनरी एप्लीकेशन इन साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी एज वेल एज आई एम थैंकफुल टू द ऑर्गनाइजिंग कमिटी एंड प्रिंसिपल फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी एज ए चेयरपर्सन for this today's technical session 3 the resource person and the speaker for this technical session none other than dr durga prasad ramteke sir he is a well known person in the science fraternity and need no introduction at all but it is customary demands that we must introduce dr durga prasad ramteke sir he completed his msc from department of physics rtm nagpur university i am also alumni of the same department so we are colleagues sir ramteke sir completed his phd from bnit vishweshwara national institute of technology nagpur he completed his post doctorate research from department of physics university of free state south africa then he worked as a researcher slovakia also <laughs> he worked 
as a visiting researchers italy the name of that department is quite difficult to us to pronounce it so yeah, it's like a <laughs> department of industrial engineering is yeah, in right, italian sir, right sir i think it is written in italian language if i am not wrong mm-hmm. yep and presently sir is working as a researcher in fiber and particle engineering faculty of technology university of ulu finland honors and award dr ramtek received he received international travel support fellowship in 2014 to attend international conference on photo luminescence in rare earth and second one seventeen international conference on luminescence and optical spectroscopy of condensed matter he also received post doctorate fellowship as a foreign researcher south africa 2015 also received travel fellowship knowledge interchange and collaboration national research foundation department of science and technology south africa sir has total citation 531 yet index 14 i 10 index 15 sir has published many research papers in the journals of national and international reviews he has presented many research papers in the national and international conferences also presented papers orally in national and international journals he has given two invited talk one is in the international conference on multifunctional material 2019 hyderabad and second one is the virtual international conference on emerging trend in chemical science university of jammu india thus we are fortunate to have such a dynamic age. as you can see dr durga prasad ramtek very dynamic enthusiastic and scholar let us join me to welcome dr ramtek sir he will be giving talk on what a waste and need of inorganic waste management over to you sir Thank you, Professor Badwai, for the kind introduction, uh, and the guru also for inviting me for this conference. So let's not waste the time. And I think you can see the screen right in the presentation yeah. mode. Guru? Hello, yes, June. Takan, mang baki zanam to. Guru, have you seen the screen in the presentation mode that I just wanted to confirm? Yeah. Yes, sir. I can. See. It's in a, it's in a full yeah. presentation mode, right? Okay, so thank you, Professor Budwaik, once again for the kind introduction and the Gaurav for inviting me for the conference. You, I think so. I am the black sheep of this conference because everyone was talking about the nano uh, luminescent material or let's say the ionics or the cell culture and everything, and I am the one who gonna be the talk on the waste and waste management. So let's start about what is waste. It's, yeah, so we are very fortunate to live on the habitable planet where we have the abundant air, sunlight, and the resources to sustain the life form. But our home planet Earth become inhabitable in next two or three generation at max, and we are at the brink of extinction due to the global warming and decrease in the natural resources. I think so. Everyone is following in the news like we are having the coal crisis right now. and uh, solid waste management is the is all is almost always the responsibility of the local government that's what we think of and is often their single largest budget item particularly in the development countries right say if you we all works in the academics and if we ask the administration like how much budget they put it for the cleaning and the cleanliness in the institution you're going to amaze like how much money they put it for the cleaning and uh, uh the solid waste management and let's say the street sweeping is also often the city's uh, single largest source of employment additionally the solid waste is a most pernicious local pollutant because uh, currently the world city generate around 1.3 billion tons of solid waste per year 
and this volume is expected to be increased to 2.2 billion tons by the year of 2025, which is huge. And the wage generation rate will be more than double over the next 20 years. So we need to think about the waste. We need to think about the solid waste we are generating uh, uh, in day-to-day -day life. So what kind of solid waste we are talking about? So these kind of pictures are pretty familiar. We, we, we're not gonna see next to our home, but if we travel, let's say some distance apart, we're gonna find this kind of dump yard. We're gonna find it like we already polluted our uh, rivers uh, and there is a lot of dumpsters around us and people are still trying to get something from there. And you're gonna see some waste pickers picking some garbage and overfeed dump yard. So this is the situation, like, that's what I say, like, uh, the, this planet going to be the inhabitable, inhabitable in next two or three generation. And the main reason, like the waste we are producing. So if you look at the solid waste, now when we generate the waste, it don't look like, like it is the big problem, but the uncollected waste is usually leading to, uh, leading contributor to the local flooding and the air and water pollution. And the solid waste is directly linked to the urbanization and uh, economics, economic development. As a country urbanized, their economic wealth increases as a standard of living and the disposal of income increases, consumption of goods and services increases, which results in corresponding increasing amount of waste we generated. So let's say if you look at the solid waste and like at the for the start, we don't think like, oh, solid waste is a big problem, but this solid waste lead to the non-sustainable development. It's lead to the uh, water pollution. It also contribute to the greenhouse gases. It also leads to the poverty and the slums. And because of this uh, poverty and the slums and the dump yards, we call, cause, uh, we get some uh, social unrest because no one wants to go to the uh, slums area or to the area where we dump our uh, waste. And it also leads to the air pollution. And that is a non-sustainable development occurring because of the solid waste. So now, if you look at the, the general map uh, of the, 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 the waste generated by the region, the Organization for Economic and Cooperation and Development, it basically it comprised with the European Union and the NATO countries. They are the biggest producer of the, the West. And if we consider about uh, the India, so we come in the EAP region, like East Asia Pacific region, and we generate around 21% of a solid waste globally. Now, if we, compare the waste generation with the income of that country. So high income country always uh, generate a huge amount of uh, waste compared to the non-development countries. The simple example, like most of us, we live in the city and we're gonna find like lots of solid waste around us. Uh, like uh, Professor Badwai, he's working in Kamla Nehru and there is a Sakkadara market, if I'm not wrong around the Kamla Nehru College. And whenever there is a big market, he may be able to see like large pile of dump. So, but if we travel to the villages, we're not gonna see that kind of uh, solid waste is piled up across the street or piled up across the dumpster. So this is the situation we used to find. Uh, so the high income countries generally, uh, the biggest producer of waste compared to the, the countries which has the low uh, income. So global waste generation per region where the, the NATO countries or the European countries makes almost half of the world's waste while Africa, South Asia figure as the region that produce the least waste. Now high income countries produce the most of the waste per capita while the low income countries produce the least solid waste per capita. Although the total waste generation for the lower middle income countries is higher than that of upper middle uh, income countries. But if you lo look at the overall pictures, as the standard of living increases, the production of waste is also increases. So what type of waste 
we see in our day to day life is like organic waste comes from the food uh, the leaves the waste uh, the woods and the process residue from the food processing now the paper paper is also a day to day waste because everyone get have the habit to read a newspaper so that newspaper the cardboard the magazine the bags and the boxes the wrapping paper the, the gift paper now telephone book is out of the context nowadays but previously we used to have this big telephone uh, books and that is also it get older after a couple of years so it comes under the waste now strictly speaking when we think about the paper paper is something like uh, classified as organic but the moment it get contaminated by anything let's say the food the in Uh, the writing it don't uh, remain a organic uh, waste or don't remain organic when it get contaminated now the plastic plastic is the biggest problem now we generally have the habit to use a plastic uh, bags to carry the the vegetables or the groceries and we also use like lots of uh, beverages which is comes in the plastic bottle we also use a thin plastic coating to or we find it when we purchase something new for our home or to give to do someone so plastic is also one with the glass bottle glass is a pretty pretty normal material like it's a part of day to day life but the glass bottle the broken glass where the light bulb the colored glasses is also type of a waste we generate it the metals metals is like uh, cans foil non hazard uh, aerosol can like when what we use for the day or drink or the perfumes and the bicycle i don't think so now anyone or uh, use the bicycle anymore but as a child or uh, like after up to certain age we have the habit to use a bike and we transfer from bike to motorcycle and that bike become a waste after some time and there is other kind of waste let's say textile the leather the rubber the multi laminate e waste e waste is the biggest problem nowadays the appliances and the ash and other inert materials so these are all the waste we generated in our day to day life so when we think about the waste the waste has a serious effect on the environment now the public health concerns have been the basic for the solid waste management program as a solid waste management is it is essential to maintain the public health now solid waste that is not properly collected or disposed can be the breeding ground for the insect vermin and the scavengers element animals and can thus pass on air and water borne diseases i think so corona is the best example how it started no one knows but it like uh, uh pass through air through water or you even with a touch so if the solid waste didn't manage it properly it can be the breeding ground for lots of lots of uh, the diseases now poorly collected or improperly disposed waste can have the detrimental impact on the environment in low and middle income countries the municipal solid waste is often dumped in a low lying areas we call it the dump yard and the land adjacent to the slum now we always have a law, lack of enforcement and regulations uh, which enable the potentially infectious medical and hazardous bio waste to be mixed with this municipal solid waste which is harmful for the waste pickers because the people who try to collect some waste and try to get a bread or the food for their daily life their health is in a serious hazard so the life of a waste picker is 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 in a, in a danger because of we don't have the proper rules and regulation how to uh, let's say manage the waste now one thing we can do is the resource resource management like um, the solid waste can be the potential uh, source or the resources for the further uh, developing the new product for example the aluminium now producing aluminium from the recycled aluminium requires 95% of less energy than producing it from the the starting materials or the virgin material so the whatever the solid waste we are generating can be 
the good uh, natural resources. So when we think about uh, the solid waste, solid waste leads to the greenhouse gas emission. Now the greenhouse gas, uh, when we talk about, we most of the times talk about the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So if we look at this chart, the greenhouse gases is mostly comes from the electricity and the heat production. And then it followed by the agriculture and the, uh, other land uses or the agriculture industry. Now, every year we heard the dispute between the Delhi, Haryana and UP. They were fighting over like, oh, you burn the crops at your uh, uh, state. And that is how the smoke is transferring to the Delhi and Delhi is uh, air getting polluted and we are uh, having some uh, the environmental crisis over here. So agriculture is also one of the biggest source of greenhouse gases. And after greenhouse gases, the construction industry or the other metallurgical industry is seriously contributing to the greenhouse gases, which is almost like a 10, 21%. And then we have the transportation because we use a diesel or the petrol for the transportation. And the 6% generally comes for, from the demolition of the buildings and the other stuff. Now, if we look at uh, the, the, the country statistics, now we're gonna find that the China uh, uh, and, uh, is, is the biggest uh, producer of the greenhouse gases compared to the, in, any other country. And it followed by the USA. And then we, it comes to the European Union. And if we look like where the India stands, India stands, uh, India produced almost 7% of the greenhouse gases. If we compare it globally, it's quite low, but it's, 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 not, a, it's not a good thing because lots of uh, infrastructure is happening in the India. So there is a lots of the cement uh, requirement and that is how there is a, uh, the greenhouse gases uh, we are producing in the country. And India is the second most country in the cement production. So India contributing almost 7% to the greenhouse gases. Now, all the waste, now all the waste produced are related to the certain economic sectors. Now I, I'm stressing this point is like poorly managed waste has an enormous impact on health, local and the global environment and also on the economy. Now in properly managed, managed waste, usually uh, in downstream costs higher than what it would have cost to manage the waste properly in the first place. The global uh, nature of the solid waste in, includes the contribution to the greenhouse gas emission. For example, methane, the organic uh, fraction present in the waste and they are also producing some sort of hazardous gases along with the CO2. So we need to think about this waste management seriously. Now, I generally work on the inorganic waste, not all kind of waste, but I, 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 I started like um, three years, four years back uh, with this uh, inorganic waste management. Before that, I did this luminescence, solicited ionics, phosphor materials, biomaterials and everything, but I changed my field four years back and I started working in the inorganic waste management. So what kind of inorganic waste we, we, we have to deal with? It's like the slags, the metallurgical industry process where we get the lots of metals, let's like say the steel, iron, aluminum, copper, even a gold and platinum. So when we process these metals, we create a lots of lots of slag uh, because of the processes we use. Now, as I mentioned, there is a lots of demolition or the formation of the new infrastructure, which create a another kind of a waste, which is come from the the construction industry technically, and the civil infrastructure. I I don't know how much you remember, but I used to listen. One advertisement on, on the All India radio is like, Gharala kutle chhatra lavave he karat nahi, char minar chhatra lavave, something like that. And that 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 uh, that cement roof is basically consists of asbestos. Asbestos is very dangerous. Uh, the substance is a carcinogenic, can cause a cancer. But we didn't thought of that in the first place. 
but now we are replacing those uh, uh, the cement roof with some modern uh, concrete uh, roof and when we replace that one we just discard that roof somewhere in the dump yard but that that uh, asbestos containing cement or that roof is the pretty dangerous one and need to be managed properly then the combustion process whenever we think about the like waste management we just collect the waste and burn it at some place and we thought like okay our job is done that's not true when the combustion process or the burning process get over we gonna see like there is a large block and that is not degradable uh, uh, naturally in the environment so that also uh, contribute to the solid waste and then we have from the day to day life the plastic bottles the glasswares and the, some other substances and then we have the replacement of the technology or updating the ex existing technology so these all contribute to the inorganic waste now I don't know how much you remember, but when the Martin Cooper developed a first mobile phone in 1973, it has a weight of seven kg. But now if you look at the modern phones is like, they have the weight of 500 grams and the memory of one terabyte. My phone has like memory of one terabyte, which is used to be like amazed because first laptop I brought, it has a memory of 256 gigabyte and now i'm using a mobile phone which having the memory of 1 terabyte so the, if you look at the journey of a mobile from from 7 kg to the 500 uh, grams or even to the 300 grams so in between we see lots of types of head, uh, cell phones but we always want a new one when we want a new one we just uh, discard it or throw it some of the mobile phones maybe you also have some experience like your phone is not working so you just sell it to the scrap vendors and scrap vendors try to collect some sort of electronics part and other parts you just put it in the dump yard so that is uh, the waste is creating due to replacement of the technology now if you look at the history of light bulbs like i saw like this kind of sent lamp to the and the organic LEDs or LEDs lights. So I, everyone see this kind of lamp. So you started with the tungsten lamp, then like, oh, it's not energy efficient. Let's move to the tube light. Then we move to the tube light and no tube light is not efficient. Let's move to the CFL. And then from CFL, we nowadays we are working on the, uh, the LED lamp, but the journey of the tungsten lamp to the LED lamp create create a lots of lots of waste and which is didn't uh, get addressed properly and they are still sitting in a dump yard because i think so a couple of people works on the luminescence and the, let's say the tube light or the cfl they have the some uh, the white light emitting coating from the terbium europium and uh, i'm not sure yeah terbium europium because this three colors contribute to the white light and no one tried to recover that part from those uh, CFL or from the tube light. So this is the journey of a light bulb. When we move from the tungsten lamp to the LED lamp, meanwhile, we created lots of inorganic waste. Now, the, another interesting part is something in our day-to-day -day life. Now, I remember myself watching He-Man cartoon on the Crown television, black and white television. I have it in my home. And now that television is replaced by the, the, the more flat screen LED screen. But meanwhile, if you look at the journey, what happens to the, those models which comes in between? So we always think like, just give it to the scrap vendor, try to get some sort of money and our job is done. No, it's not. If as a researcher or, or as an academic researcher, we always have to think about like when we propose like okay this material gonna be good for certain application you're replacing the technology but when you're replacing the technology what is happening to the existing technology you have also have to look over that part so this is something like sorry i'm complaining but this is this is what is happening when we move from the one technology to the another now 
inorganic waste managed by the vitrification. Now, this is the very simple process for vitrification of any, any let's say, the, uh, the, uh, the, the inorganic waste. So vitrification is generally like dissolving all the components or the hazardous waste in a molten glass at a high temperature. Uh, so, so advantages of this is like the flexibility of the process. You can melt anything uh, uh, in that molten mass. Now, with this technique, the vitrification process, uh, the, if you have any organic uh, contamination or organic waste, that waste is going to uh, destruct with the efficiency of almost 99.99% because as a, some of the people, they also work in the biomedical or the biophysics, they know that certain bacteria, they, they can still uh, sustain at a higher temperature. But this vitrification process gonna help you to destruct uh, organic substance with a 99.99 efficiency. Now, it offers a good stabilization. If someone is following the BARC, Bava Atomic Research Center, they're utilizing this vitrification process for the uh, immobilization of radioactive waste. And they did some good job with some borosilicate glasses. So this is the one, one thing uh, you can think of when you want to do some inorganic waste management. So, and the product we obtained from the vitrification process have a very good uh, mechanical and the thermal property. So one can think about the inorganic waste manage by, management by the vitrification process, but it also has some disadvantages because First thing first, high cost plant, because when you think about the vitrification process, you need a temperature, which is like 1600 to 1700 degrees Celsius. And the amount of waste we generated, we if you want to immobilize that kind of waste, we need a very bigger plant. And that gonna be like very, very costly. Uh, so the high cost plants is a one disadvantage. And there is a poor revenue from this vitrification process. So no one really wants to think of this. And then if you look at the cost or benefit balance, it's like very difficult to achieve with this vitrification process. And as it used the energy, so this energy contributed to the uh, CO2. And I think so I mentioned earlier is like we are for if someone is following the energy crisis or the coal crisis in India. So most of our, uh, the electricity is comes from the thermal plant and we are still using the coal as a starting material. So and if I'm using the furnace, which is uh, which going to give me the temperature of 1600. So it going to seriously, seriously contribute to the, the global CO2. So these are a couple of disadvantage from the uh, from the the vitrification process. Now inorganic glass waste. I started dealing with uh, inorganic glass waste uh, two years back. So these are, this kind of inorganic waste is like the waste from the bottles or the glass bottles. Now the tube lights are there, the tungsten lamps are there. Then there are the glass fiber, and there are something like a broken glasses. So if you look at the statistic, if you look at the statistic, only 34% of the glass waste is getting recycled. Let's say if, because in the simple example, like if you have the two bottles, uh, let's say the best example is like a liquor bottle. If you have the bottle, which is uh, of a whiskey, for example, which is most of the time is a colorless. And if you have the bottle of a beer, which is most of the time is a color. And if you go to the scrap vendor, and if you want to get some sort of money for those bottles, glass vendor going to offer you the, let's say, technically one rupees for the, the clear bottle or the uncolored bottle. But if you try to exchange the, the colored bottle, let's say, or the beer bottle, he just going to offer you the 25 cent. And if you ask him why, he going to give you a very simple answer. He gonna say like no one like to buy that is because the all the colored glasses are very difficult to recycle. So those colored glasses are often ended up in a dump yard. 
So that's why I say is like, whatever the glass waste we produce in globally, out of which only 34% get recycled and the rest of it just ended up in a dump yard. And you can check the report, you can go to the gpi.org and you can find like how, uh, uh, how much glass we produce globally, how much it is getting recycled. So, so what is the solution for that? So when I was working with the industrial engineering in University of Padua, Italy, we took over or think over uh, the glass foam. Glass foam is something like a material which has a high porosity comprised mostly due to a closed cell and they are separated with the thin walls. And they are like very light, very light. I have a couple of my samples. And if you look at the density, density is something like 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 grams. And if you look at their strength, they are like quite strong. And usually they have the compressive strength of more than one megapascal. The sample we prepared, it has a strength of let's say around eight megapascal. And if they are uh, not flammable, uh, like if I took those, uh, take those samples and put it uh, in some sort of flame, uh, they're not gonna get burned. They're not gonna release any kind of glasses. And if I look at the mechanical properties, then mechanical properties are not subject to the uh, degradation of the materi material. And we can produce them in a different forms. So we can produce in a loose aggregate. We can produce in um, the larger blocks. We can also produce them uh, in, in, in some sort of uh, pellet form. So these things we were trying to achieve when I was working with the, uh, working in Italy. So if I look at the foam glass and some of the properties, they are waterproof because it consists of a glass. And they cannot be wrought and they're like pest proof because it's an inorganic material and uh, the pest or, or the insect, they try to basically uh, harvest themselves on the organic material as I'm working, uh, as the glass is an inorganic material, they are like a technically insect proof. They cannot burn because it consists of glass. And let's say if you want to melt those substance, you need a temperature which is like 1600, uh, let's say around 700 or 800 degrees Celsius. This has external ordinary strength. I, I, I tested a couple of samples and they are like I amazed the strength we found it out with those. And uh, it's less resistant to the most of the inorganic sol organic solvent and acid because it consists of the pure glass. Now, most of us are the academic research researcher and we use a glassware for most of our experimental purpose. And the glass is quite stubborn toward the organic acid. It's not stubborn toward the base, but it's quite stubborn to the acid. Then you can easy to work with them. You can just take a jigsaw, cut it in the, in the shape whatever you want it. And you can have the block, you can have the this particular structure you required for your your application. And these are kind of vapor proof or the gas proof because uh, the pores in the foam glass, they are like uh, the sealed, uh, uh, sealed uh, they are in a sealed cell and they are quite environmental friendly because the processing temperature is quite low. And there is, instead of using uh, the natural material, you can use the waste material and you can produce them uh, with uh, not harming the environment further. So it's basically a cellular glass and it can be done by the recycling of the glass. So now glass foam as a typical example of glass centering, it also has the great uh, recycling potential. Basically what happened in the foam glass is like a pyroplastic mass flow. And it's usually depend on the, the glass composition. Like we, I don't know how much you remember, the, but there is a soda lime glass, there is a borosilicate glass, there's a boro aluminum silicate glass, different kind of glass we use it. And when we prepare this glass foam, we don't need, a, need to melt a glass and we can further uh, recycle uh, it can use the recycled glass rather than uh, using the raw material. And it has a significant glass recycling potential and it's also kind of green manufacturing 
because we use a very low temperature and temperature is for like 90 degree celsius for just like a 30 minutes so it's kind of green manufacturing but the foaming agent is a controversial issue uh, uh, the one thing is like a cost most of the time uh, if you look at the 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 the, the biggest producer of a foam glass the corning they use a silicon carbide as a foaming agent which is kind of expensive uh, so the cost is one issue and but over the decades researchers uh, make some improvement and they use like carbon containing ash and they also use the recovered silicon carbide for example now the the uh, some of the people like the professor i was working with in italy he used a glass polishing waste as a foaming agent and then he produce a foam glass out of it now some of the researchers also use a silicon carbide polishing paper as a uh, as a foaming agent so over the decade there are a couple of improvement like try to use a different kind of foaming agent but the emission of a carbon oxide glasses may gases may be carbon dioxide or the carbon monoxide is still an issue and you need to add some different foaming additives so these are the couple of drawbacks of this inorganic foaming agent so when we work with we started working with the foam glass we were trying to address this kind this par properties particularly like density porosity compressive strength and elastic modulus so we were trying to get uh, the properties which is similar to the commercially available foam glass with the inorganic waste glass we are using so i started with the the glass fiber because there is a one company uh, in a europe and they have like lots of lots of glass fiber waste and they needed a solution so we took that uh, project from the company and we used the alkali activation technique so alkali activation technique is like a very basic thing we don't you don't need a high fine machinery or something like that uh, we just started with a simple uh, the mechanical stirrer so in that you take a glass powder mix it with some uh, molar solution of um, uh, sodium hydroxide you stir it for like 3 hours then uh, the glass usually melts or dissolve in the basic solution so it from a gel then we used to add some surfactant is like they we use a triton x as a surfactant and we rigorously uh, stir it at around like 2000 rpm for some time so that it can form a foam and that body we dried at 40 degrees celsius uh, and then we fire it at different temperature and we use uh, we we we, we uh, received the foam glass so if you look at the basic composition of any glass system it all, always comprises of silica calcium aluminum and some part of the borate and this composition vary with which kind of uh, glass you are using so the whatever the green body uh, we 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 received after drying at 40 degree celsius uh, its xrd is in figure a and when we fire this uh, green bodies at 700 uh, degrees celsius it didn't found any changes uh, in the xrd there are some crystalline peaks which we with of very weak intensity for 3 molar and 2 molar uh, alkali activated glasses but at 7 degrees celsius uh, they are not showing like uh, any prominent peaks with some xrd analysis we further try to classify which peaks belong to which but when we fire them at at 800 degree celsius and it completely uh, the ceramics phase is completely evolved and we got something which is a glass ceramic which contain a glassy part a total black amorphous hump along with the the crystalline part and crystalline part we observe is a zeolite and zeolite is kind of a uh, very good uh, cementitious material with a good strength and when we look at the optical micrograph so figure a and figure d is the green body like we create at some sort of pores in the in the alkali activated uh, glass fibers and when we fire these pores retain their shape 
And if you look at in figure E and figure F, you kind of see some shiny part. Uh, the shiny part because it's glass is somehow started to melt. So that's why that shiny part comes in. But if you look at the like B and C, uh, there is no uh, shiny part, but it still had some good strength. So with a different alkali activation, you can uh, different molarity of the alkali activated solution. You can get a different kind of strength, different kind of pores, and you can tune the material according to your need. So that is one thing. So as I mentioned is like, we wanted to compare the basic properties like density uh, and compressive strength with the commercially available classes. So, so the, uh, the density we observe for the, the sample is like apparent density is around let's say 0 0.6 to 0 0.5 gram per centimeter cube, which has a porosity of around let's say 80%. And when we look at the compressive strength and compressive strength of this sample is like eight megapascal, which is actually greater than the commercially available substances. Now the commercially available product uses all 20% uh, of the waste and 80% uh, of the, the natural resources. And we created this with, uh, by using 100% uh, waste product. So this is kind of achievement. Now, every day we see this kind of as like Ambuja cement, Bangla cement, ultra tech, dish cement, tiki bunny style. But the problem is that they didn't tell you one thing is like 8% of global anthropologic CO2 is come from the cement industry only. And in the year 2018, there was a production of 4,100 million tons of cement. And if you look at like how much CO2 it emits in the environment, it's like huge. A simple chemistry is like most of the people working in the material science and simple chemical equation is like calcium carbonate uh, at 500 degrees Celsius gonna give you calcium oxide plus CO2. So if you try to find out like how much uh, amount of uh, CA per 10 grams of uh, calcium oxide uh, created from the calcium carbonate, it's around seven grams of CO2 for 10 grams of calcium carbonate. So yeah. Therefore, we need to find uh, another supplementary symmetric case material. And then for that, the metacaulin, multani mitti, I think so, pretty general or the common term uh, uh, we use for the, uh, the metacaulin uh, can be a good supplementary symmetric case material. The glasses can also be the good supplementary symmetric case material. And there is a fly ash, blast furnace slag, or the steel slag from the various metallurgical process can also be act as a good supplementary cemented test material. So we decided to do some upcycling of from the glass waste and we, we invented one technique, uh, which is we call it as a cold consolidation method and the temperature we use to form a ceramic body is up just to 40 degree Celsius, so which is quite low. So that's why we term it as a cold consolidation and uh, the challenges we receive from one company is like the ph pharmaceutical borosilicate glass and the soda lime glass, which is uh, the borosilicate glass is quite stubborn to the in any any kind of a chemical attack. And uh, so we use those glasses to form uh, a, a ceramic at lower temperature. And these are the green bodies we able to form by using uh, the cold consolidation method at 40 degrees Celsius. And when we check the XRD, we found out like, okay, there is a lots of crystalline phases is like zeolite, soda light, quartz, gypsite, which is, those are like quite a good cementitious phases. And also we also found the uh, uh, aluminum hydrox hydroxide, which is a pretty stubborn or a good, uh, uh, the stable phase with 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 pretty good um, compressive strength. And one interesting thing we also observe, like when we are doing some FTIR analysis, we observe one uh, the CO2 bank, and we were suspecting like okay maybe there is some sort of carbon sequestration, or uh, the material is absorbing some sort of carbon dioxide from the environment, 
and uh, it allowing it to sequestrate in the material. So we are trying to develop, we are trying to patent it right now, uh, this, uh, this method and uh, try to uh, understand the carbon sequestration uh, properties of this material also. But in SEM, when we found that like, okay, the glass particles were melted properly and they are interconnected with some sort of micro pores. Uh, so this is quite interesting for us. And we always uh, work or we, we look for the properties which is equivalent or beneficial for the building industry. So we always go for the compressive strength uh, or the flexual strain and the density of the material. So the, the ceramic or the coal uh, material we prepared from the coal consolidation method, it has a compressive strength of 30 megapascal. Now, if you look at the compressive strength from the cement, the one we use, we call it as a ordinary Portland cement, the one day strength of this OPC or the cement is around 30 megapascal one day. So. The, what we try, try to achieve with the waste material is like kind of good for the, the building industrial application. Now we were trying like lots of things. Uh, we also were trying to use the, uh, the metacaulin uh, as a supplementary cement TTS material. Now geopolymer is a well-known term in the building industry thing. So we, that Multani Mitti, I think that is the pretty common term. If we look for in the general term, we call it as a, for the metacaulin. So we just took some metacaulin, we form a homogeneous slurry by mixing it with the phosphoric acid solution, not uh, with a, a zero, one molar uh, phosphoric acid solution. And we just stir it for three hours at 500 RPM. Then we try to utilize one inorganic waste that is a glass fiber waste into that one. So we introduced the glass fiber in that one, which has a length of three to five centimeter uh, in that slurry. And um, we dried it at, at 40 degrees Celsius in the closed environment. And then we did some boiling test for that one. And uh, so that uh, we ensure there is a completion of geopolymer. I think somehow I can play this video, maybe later. So we perform the boiling test. Like first thing, when we work in the building industry or the material for the construction material, what are the material we take? We take a piece of it, we put it in the boiling water for at least three to four hours and see whether this material is stable in the harsh condition or not. And we observe like the material we prepared uh, with this uh, metacaulin and uh, glass fiber as a filler, they are like quite stable in a harsh condition. So we just take a samples with a different shape, cut it and use it for the further. And this is the prototype. Uh, it's like we able to prepare, uh, it's like uh, 18 centimeter, uh, tiles we prepared in the laboratory by using the geopolymer uh, as a as a supplementary cement test material now when we uh, took the xrd the uh, the, the basic crystalline peaks are from the static material the metacaulin but we observed that there is a change in the the area of the amorphous uh, part when we activated it with the phosphoric acid and there is a formation of another uh, uh, phase in the phosphoric acid activated geopolymer, uh, which is like aluminum oxide, which is the binding phase, which was giving the strength to the, the prepared material. So now the basic idea is like, we have lots of, lots of, uh, uh, the phase is present in a metacaulin. Then when we activated it with the phosphoric acid, the aluminum and phosphate uh, come together and from aluminum phosphate, which is a quite strong phase. And it is forming a one ceramic body uh, when we activated with the phosphoric acid. So now 
when there was no glass fiber introduced there were there was some micro cracks in the in the in the in the in the body we prepared but the, at the moment when we started to introduce the glass fiber in that one this micro crack started to getting disappear and uh with uh, the simple reason is like the glass fibers which is like 3 to 5 cm long were acting as a glass filler so they were actually preventing the microstructural cracks happening in the sample and the biggest achievement is for us is like we were uh uh vitrifying 80% uh extra inorganic waste in that geopolymer matrix so thing is like this this we started with the inorganic glass fiber someone can introduce the textile fiber someone can also use the plastics because plastic is a very big problem i think so government of india already banned the 3 mm plastics in india but we still use it and that is creating a some sort of waste so this technique can be further improved for the textile waste plastic waste or any fibrous waste from the uh from the agricultural also so i always say we always look for the the mechanical properties of the material so we always look for the compressive strength and the bending strength of the material so the compressive strength for the material with uh glass fiber as a as a as a as a uh the filler is is like 35 35 uh mega pascal which is like quite high quite high compared to the uh uh not compared to the but is equivalent to the cement because one day strength of the cement is around 30 mega pascal so it has a compressive strength of 35 mega pascal so you cannot use as a cement but you can use them to form a tiles for your kitchen for your washroom for uh, for your garden uh, because they are also thermally insulating they are uh, soundproof also and why i said this glass fiber are acting as a filler because we take the optical micrograph of the fractured surface and we found as like fibers are popping out from this fractured surface surface so they are basically acting as a filler preventing uh, the microstructural crack and also providing strength to the material so in conclusion so what we did we we found is like uh, feasibility of glass foam for um, from the alkali activation and gel casting like we can use this technique to uh, the recycling recycling of the glass waste or the inorganic waste and this method like i tried with the borosilicate glass uh the fiber glass and the soda lime glass but there are other different glasses uh, uh, in our day to day life and you can use that inorganic alkali activation technique to form a foam glass which can be a good uh for the green environment or towards the saving the environment and this uh, glass foam can also be used to in a inertization of the heavy metal because some of the metallurgical process have the uh, the waste of heavy metals let's say the cobalt or the molybdenum so we can use these uh, slags to inertize in the foam and then you can put it in the circular economy as a building product and the geopolymer matrix like i says i tried with the fiber glasses and uh, you can use this or someone can use people already using for like uh, metal fibers they are also using for the textile fiber they are also someone can also use for the plastic uh, so that you can put all the waste in the green e- economy and the material we prepared like we, we were thinking no it's from the waste is not going to have the good strength but it's strong the material we prepared have the good strength comparable uh, with the the commercially available product and uh, this this techniques or this waste management can put all the waste in the circular economy and this circular economy can help you to reduce a greenhouse gases so 
what is the most preferred option when we think about the, the waste management? The least preferred option is something like control dump, try to avoid the drum, dump, try to avoid the throwing the waste to the, the dump yard or to the landfill. And the most preferred option is supposed to be like a reduce and try to reuse whatever you have. Like if, if before discarding it, try to use it like a couple of times so that, so that uh, you don't need to spend the extra money on the same substance again and again. Think about recycle because we are not thinking. We just think like what are the waste we have? We put it in a dump yard. Our job is done. No, it's not done. You have to think about recycle. Try to recover as much as possible from the waste you're generating. So most preferred option is like reduce, reuse, and recycle. And last preferred option supposed to be like incineration or the control dump or put it in the last field. Because environment is something you can pass it to from one generation to the another. Your wealth is not that important. I think so. Everyone has this experience in this Corona time. Like when you needed the resources, your wealth was not in, not uh, helping you to get the resources to treat someone who having the Corona. So environment is something which you can pass from one generation to the another. So think about the environment. Please think about the recycle. Please think about the CO2. If you are not thinking about that, after two or three generations, this planet Earth is going to be on the worth, on the brink of collapse. You can already see like there is increase in a global temperature by three degree. Three degree, those who live in a Maharashtra, three degree is like nothing. But on the global scale, three degree is like very much. So think about the environment. And these are the people I work with. Uh, Bernardo in University of Padova, Acasio was my colleague in Padova. Now I work with Amiria and the Paiwo. And, and the, on the left-hand side, the pyramid we form is a fiber and particle engineering unit. So it is pretty irony for me because I started something with the physics and the luminescence and all that stuff. And now I suddenly change my area to the cement and the construction material. But the whole group as a fiber and particle engineering unit, we always think about the, uh, the life cycle assessment, the CO2, the utilization of the inorganic waste and the construction material. So this is uh, the, the pyramid we form is like a fiber and particle engineer unit. I am somewhere there, a second block or something like that. And I am Durga Prasad Ramteke. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramteke, sir. Uh, welcome, Professor Badwak. Thanks for your informative and knowledgeable talk on what a waste need of inorganic waste management. You started right from the basic of the solid waste to directly relate higher income group countries produce most waste you also discuss the type of waste such as organic waste paper waste plastic waste metal waste and their resources you also talked about the how the waste affect the environment and also the give the comparison of greenhouse gas emitted by the different economic sector industry emission 21 percent transportation emits 14 percent construction of building six percent agriculture and land 24 percent heat and electricity 25 percent you also gave the comparison of the greenhouse gas emission by the different country the most contribution is from china 30 percent next us 15 percent European Union, 9%. Then, like India, 7%. You discuss type of waste, inorganic, waste, inorganic. There are different type of inorganic waste, such as metallurgical, industrial waste, demolition of building, civil infrastructure. All these sector will produce the inorganic waste. And how to manage inorganic waste by 
vitrification process you explain nicely you have explained the advantages and disadvantages of this method disadvantages we can state that high cost of the plant energy consumption is more because the temperature required is more than 1600 degree centigrade poor revenue and this contribute emission of the co2 also we also discuss the solution to manage the glass waste you describe cycling of glass waste by new novel called consolidation methods thank you thank you very much sir for your informative talk definitely all participant will be benefited by your talk and topic you have chosen is the common one it is applicable to the science faculty participant arts arts faculty part participant as well as commerce so it is the interdisciplinary topic we can say thank you thank you very much sir for your knowledgeable talk over to you gaurav yeah thanks professor badwai uh thanks for <laughs> Uh, having the keen interest in that one I, i again want to say is like when i i mentioned somewhere like when i started my phd uh, in vnit like i started with the solid state ionics and the lithium ion batteries and then i moved to the luminescence and all that stuff but when i moved to like this area four years back is like uh, those who working in the luminescence or the solid state ionic batteries is like okay we need a high high technology or high high profile characterization and when i come to the the construction industry or the construction science is like we just started with the basic that's why it's a irony for me because i am the physicist by degree the condensed matter physicist and now i'm working for the civil engineering so it's completely like 360 degree rotation for me to change in the field and everything but thanks for having the keen interest and thank you for uh, introducing me at the start Gaurav, see there are any queries in the chat box? Uh, no, sir. There are no queries in chat box. Okay. Okay. No queries, man. Sir, explain nicely and self-explanatory presentation. So there are no queries from participant. I think. <laughs> so proceed for the topic. <laughs> now this uh, plenary talk about inorganic inorganic waste management was very knowledgeable interesting and effective this is very informative and impressive talk so i would like to call uh, miss pallavi narwade madam for vote of thanks So for good afternoon to one and all gathered here for this international e conference today i am here to express our deep sense of thanks for this session it was the marathon session with sprinkle of energy i hope we all enlightened and educated with this session on behalf of the faculty of science and iqsc sri vithal rukmini mahavidyalay sona i deem it a great honor to propose the oath of thanks to the plenary speaker of this session dr durga prasad ramteke sir for delivering excellent presentation thank you sir also i would like to propose heartily oath of thanks to the chairperson of this session dr dilip badwai sir thank you sir i sincerely thanks doc uh, sorry mr gaur for conducting this session last but not least and last but not least i am thankful to the respected dignitaries faculties research scholar and dear students for your presence to this online platform again thanks to all now this session is over here after the 45 minutes of lunch break we will continue the next session so i request you all i request you all to join the next session at 2:30 o'clock thank you thank you Thank you.
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक्स अलॉट बाय बाय बाय